for most and a lot of the world. But only with thine eyes shall thou see the destruction of the wicked. For I am ready to turn over what the enemy has held unto you who look and trust in me for thou shalt be the saviors of the world saith God now you'll never be the savior Jesus is he's the one that paid the price but you are going to deliver the word that tells of what he has accomplished and you're going to walk in his glory and you're going to walk in his power the world needs a sample, a sample of what he is in man. And that's all he is doing right now. He's still working on that sample. Because we, in all of our spiritual understanding, and in all of our talking, still don't always believe everything God wants to do in us amen. amen and we look too much at what we see with our natural eye and we still allow ourselves to be deceived by what we see make no doubt about it God's gonna change this world the wickedness he will destroy Amen? But he's going to destroy it by the brightness of his coming. I was thinking this morning as I was picking up Carl, I was thinking the enemy, Satan, the adversary, all he is is a contrary way of thinking. A different mind. That if you don't conform and do things according to that mind, you don't get anywhere in this world. But we're not of this world. Oh, hallelujah. Now, what legal right he ever had to exist ended on Calvary's cross. Amen? Before Jesus paid the price, God and man were separated, given that other mind total control in mankind. But when Jesus came, he paid the price so that the law no longer condemns us his blood has redeemed us brought us back together with god and nothing the enemy can accuse us of stands before god anymore so he has no legal hold on us the only power that the devil possesses is people believing his lies. How many know he still exists? He still lies. And as long as people believe the lie, they forsake their own mercy. Amen? But Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That devil has no authority or power or control. Yeah, if you don't do things the way the world does, you won't get very far in the world. Can somebody say amen? But Jesus said, ye are not of this world. Scripture says, righteousness exalteth a nation. Well, if righteousness exalts a nation, how many righteousness also exalts the individual? 
He who walks in the ways of God, he who is honest, he who is loving and caring, he who gives unto others. How many know God will raise that person up? Promotion is of the Lord. And though you may not get very far in some corporations or among a lot of people in the world, how many know people want to find someone that's honest? Amen? People want to be treated right. In the end, righteousness exalts a nation. Oh, praise the Lord. One world is over. And a new world has begun. And all God's waiting for is a people to believe it. To start walking in it. To start practicing it. You see, the enemy that we fight isn't the politicians. Though they do have an agenda, and their agenda is out to destroy us. Come on, that's to, to ignore that is to be like an ostrich with his head in the sand. But the Bible says, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Oh, hallelujah. And what we're, not, what we're fighting against isn't Obama. Although, let me tell you something, the things he wants to do is not for our benefit. But no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And there are other elite rulers of the world. Because how many know, those that possess the money possess the world. What's the old saying? Uh... Money walks and something else talks. We won't fully quote that. But how many of Scripture declares the wealth of the wicked is being laid up for the righteous? How do we fight this battle? By not allowing that same mind that's working in them to work in us. You don't have to even fight this battle outwardly. Now, God has people who are fighting this thing politically, and I believe God has placed them in that place because that job is necessary. There are, there are, there are Christian schools that are under attack, and there are those who know the legal system and who are, and know our constitutional rights and are fighting for, for uh, Christian schools, for other churches, for a lot of a lot of things that are going on, even you know, we what we don't know is there's stuff out there trying to block what we're doing. They don't want us on the internet or anyone like us on the internet. But God is in control. Amen. How we fight the battle is not allowing the mind that is working in them to work in us. Because, you see, people are going to flock to where there's unselfish motives. People are going to flock to where there is true freedom. People are going to flock where people are genuinely caring and loving for them. Not just putting on a face. Not just using people to get what they want. People are going to flock to a people that's going to tell them the truth. Amen. Not lie to them to manipulate and get whatever it is they want. People want, are looking for a people that are up front. Not hiding anything. Oh, praise the Lord. And how we're going to win this war 
is by not allowing that mind that is working in them to work in us. Oh, praise the Lord. So the greatest weapon is the preaching of the gospel and the demonstration of it in our lives. Amen. The whole war really isn't what's going on around us. The whole war is what's going on within us. Because every one of us, at some time or another, are tempted to do things the way the world does them because we see it work for them. Come on. You know, well, if I just lie about this little thing here, you know, you know, if I tell the IRS I really didn't make this much money, you know, my taxes won't be as high. Whether the IRS has a legal right to exist or not, actually, I do not believe they do. The, the, the whole income tax was only invented, supposedly, to finance World War II. Once World War was II was over and paid for, the income tax was to go away. But whenever those in power introduce things like that, how many notice they never go away? Any way they can get your money so they can survive and live the way they want to live and do the things they want to do and push their agenda, they do. So somebody could justify in their mind, well, what they're doing isn't right, so what does it matter if what I do isn't right? It matters a lot. Because you're, you're letting that same mind that's trying to control you from that end control you from the other end. Peter one day was approached because they were not paying their taxes. And so he come to Jesus and he said, you know, we owe taxes. Well, Jesus looked at him and said, well, who is it that's supposed to be taxed? And, uh, you know, Peter said, well, it's not the children of the nation. I forget exactly his words. But they really didn't owe the tax that they, that they were being charged for. So did, so, but Jesus didn't say, well, don't pay it. He said, nevertheless, we're going to be up front. We're going to do what's right. Go catch a fish. And in that fish's mouth will be enough for your taxes and mine. Jesus went the other mile. They came to Peter for his taxes. They didn't come to Jesus for his. But he says, here, pay it all. Let, him be let us be completely legal with the way they think. Because, you see, our dependency is it upon man. Our dependency is upon God. How many are hearing me today? We must be different. Because the world is crooked, is no excuse for us to be crooked. In fact, God said he's going to take the crooked and make it straight. Oh, hallelujah. And when people see that people doing things God's way is causing them to prosper, Causing them to uh, have influence. How many know it's going to get their attention? There's another world here in their midst. Oh, hallelujah. Turn around to your neighbor and say, you're the new world order. 
Oh, praise the Lord. Well, if you got your Bibles, I'm not sure where I want to start this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Scripture we have been preaching on, down in verse 21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, according to the book of Proverbs. Amen? And that candle, when it is lit, giveth light, understanding to man's whole being. That spirit is not a human spirit. That spirit is God himself functioning in man. Because when God created us, he or when he first conceived of us, let me say it that way. He created us. He formed us out of the natural order. Amen? But he conceived of us first in his mind as a part of himself. So that man is in an extension of God. Amen? Adam was formed of the dust of the ground. He was created as a natural being. But then God breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and he became a living soul. He became awakened to his true identity because the breath of life was the Spirit. It was God functioning in him and if Adam would continue to partake of that influence that voice that would inwardly speak to him revealing to him his real nature and character and if he had eaten of that tree how many know he would have never died Spiritually or naturally. Because it's God in man. But instead of listening to that voice, he allowed someone else in the garden to voice his philosophy his opinion, his idea of what we are and can be on our own. How that we can know for ourselves what's good and right for us and what's not. We don't need no God. We have everything we need just within our own natural being. Our eyes just need to be open to our own potential. That is the whole basis of our educational system. To open up man to see what he can do in himself. Come on. They want to take God completely out of the equation. But without him. We're nothing because God created us to be an extension of Him. We're a part of Him. All the time we're resisting God, we're resisting the real person that we are, but we're listening to this other voice deceiving us to telling us that this thing is all we are. Robbing us of our potential and of our real identity. Man bought that lie, and when he did, he was separated from God, and that voice that he listened to, that way of thinking, then became the spirit that worked in him. That adversarial 
nature and character and mind, which the Bible calls Satan, the adversary. Amen? The word Satan means adversary. Adversary is an enemy. And the Bible is clear. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It was that mind that was introduced back here in the garden. They listened to it. It was that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate of that tree. And it separated them from God. Giving that mind the legal right and control. because And the law just strengthened it. God gave the law to show man he could not measure up in his own ability. Amen? For by the law, in the book of Romans, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Therefore no man is justified by the law. The law condemned man because if man could not keep the commandments, then he would die. Amen? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And the Bible says sin is the transgression of the law. The law showed man he was a sinner and could never measure up. So that mind today still tries to to deceive people, well, listen, you're human. This is what you are. You don't have to listen to some old archaic idea about what's right and wrong. You make up your own mind what's right and wrong. Situation ethics. You know, used to justify One's failures used to justify one's weaknesses. But telling man that he can be great all on his own and, you know, what things the Bible may say is wrong aren't necessarily wrong. That book was written for a bunch of religious folk way back then you need to think for yourself how many are hearing me that's what the tree is about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil it's about man making his idea his eyes will be open that he can choose for himself he don't need no relationship with God how many can hear that today that Mind had legal right because man was separated from God. But when Jesus came and he fulfilled the law by himself, taking that death upon him, then that ended the right of that mind to control man. That mind only controls man today because man still listens to that voice and believes the lie. And religious people believe the lie that there's this great powerful devil that we're at war against that the Bible says has been brought to ruination. Amen? Amen. I am. Well, you can pull down all the strongholds in your imagination that you think are out there, and you're allowing those strongholds to rule you inside here, and how many know nothing gets done? We need to attack the ones that are trying to control us. Oh, praise the Lord. The spirit of man goeth upward. Shh. Bringing him to his identity in God. The spirit of the beast takes him downward. To the natural. To the earth. To the lower things. Pride. Lust. Selfishness. Survival. 
If you're worried about your survival, you're not trusting God. Hello? Amen. In him we live and move and have our being. We either believe what he says or we don't. Egypt was in darkness. Egypt was plagued. But there was light in the land of Goshen. What happens to the world should not control the people of God. Amen. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. And so, the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth, that is the spirit over in Ephesians chapter 2, where it says, where in time past we walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So that the spirit that is working in unregenerated man is not the spirit of man that's a candle of the Lord, which is God himself operating in man. It is the adversarial, carnal mind, that spiritual force that we call Satan or the devil, whose first place he is mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 3. Amen? You... Don't find him anywhere before Genesis because there are no other books before Genesis. That is where he is introduced. There in Genesis chapter 3, right around verse 1. I could read there, but it said, Now the, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Amen? Is that, is that what it says? That identifies his origin. The serpent is more subtle than any beast. So what is a serpent? He's a beast. Then he's not a beautiful angel up in heaven somewhere who thought he was just too good looking thought he was just thought thought you know shoot I look better than God I think I'm going to rule things up here so I'm going to talk to some of the other angels and see if we can't have us a little revolution the first revolutionary war. And a third of the angels listened to this guy. And so they went and they stormed the throne of God. They call him Lucifer. And they're all going to storm the throne of God and they're going to cast God out of the throne. And Mr. Good-looking Lucifer is going to sit there. Now, first of all, if that, to believe that, you have to have an awful small picture of God. To think God is in any kind of a position that something that he created is going to overthrow him. That kind of makes... Whatever's trying to overthrow him, all, as powerful as he is. We can resist God, but only with what we do in our own life. Uh, he is in no danger of us taking his throne away. Can somebody say amen? amen. If God was on the level of humanity in his thinking... Well, all you'd have to do is just say, you think you're going to take care of me? I created you? Poof, you're gone. And he just starts all over again with a... No, he, 
before he ever created. He knew exactly what man was going to do, and he had a plan for it. His name is Jesus. God knew when he gave man an ability to choose, man would make the wrong choice. It was all part of his plan. But he had a plan to redeem man. Oh, hallelujah. I hope you're getting something out of this this morning. So, this war was raged, waged, and God kicked the devil out. Then he shows up as a serpent, I guess. Problem of it is, the first place he's mentioned is in Genesis. All this other stuff isn't in the Bible. There are two passages of Scripture totally taken out of context, which they use for their theory. But let me tell you where they got their idea. They got their idea from the Romans, which got theirs from Greek mythology. It was hey, it was the god Hades, the god of the dead, that uh, made war with Zeus. The number one God. And then Zeus casts Hades out of Mount Olympus and banishes him into the center of the earth. And they call that place Hades. When the Bible talks about Hades, it is simply the grave but in greek mythology hades was a place in the center of the earth all this came upon king nebuchadnezzar at the end of the 12 months he walked in the palace of the kingdom of babylon the king spake and said is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by, my, by the might of my power? For the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou knowest that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Oh, Daniel 4, I'm sorry. I'm, but I'm going to read verse 32. Yeah. The verses proceeding verse 32, Nebuchadnezzar says, Is this not the kingdom that I have built by my own power? And he's completely leaving God out of the picture when he knows God is the one that give it to him. Daniel has been speaking to him. By the way, that's important to know because Daniel's going to come up in Ezekiel 30 in Ezekiel 28 too. So Daniel has already told him the truth. But Nebuchadnezzar is so lifted up in his own pride. This is what I have built. And it said, while the words were coming out of his mouth, God began to speak that he was going to be led out. He was going to basically go insane, and they were going to put him out with the animals. 
until seven times pass over. And this is what verse 32 is talking about. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with beasts, with the beasts of the field. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Does your Bible say that? So then, all these world leaders were actually put in their position by God. Only they got lifted up in pride and turned it into something evil. With that foundation, Okay, Ezekiel 28, and I'm going to start in verse 1. Are we all on the same page? Okay. I'm starting in verse 1 so we can keep this in its context. Whatever these things represent, they are literally spoken to whom the person it says it's spoken to. I remember a person getting up here and they were preaching Isaiah 14 and they were trying to say how that, that was the devil. And they were saying, well, you know, I just believe I don't have to spiritualize or go to this scripture. That I just believe the Bible uh, says what it says. And, then they, and so then she's saying that the, it, this is about the devil. She said, but I don't know why it's talking about this king of Babylon. I don't know what he's doing in here. Well, if you're believing the Bible for what it's saying, it's actually talking about the king of Babylon. That's who it's addressed to. Yeah. Now, he may represent something, but literally, that's who the scripture's talking about. And here, it's talking about the king of Tyre, Tyrus. Verse 1, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. Who is he talking to and who is saying this? Well, I mean, he's talking to Ezekiel. Who is Ezekiel prophesying about? Who is the subject? The king of Tyrus. The prince of Tyrus. Well, then, we, then, then if we're going to believe the Bible, that's who it's about. The prince of Tyrus. And we're going to find out the Prince of Tyrus represents the nature of unregenerated man. Amen? Amen? Now let's, verse 3. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Now don't you think he's talking about the attitude of the king of or the prince of Tyrus. See, Daniel's in the picture. This is one of the kings that came after Babylon. Yeah. One that was in power. And they all knew the prophecies and the wisdom of Daniel. And this prince of Tyrus thought he was wiser than Daniel. You know anybody like that today? People that think they're wiser than men and women of God? Wiser than the scriptures? Because 
with thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures by thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. You really think you're something because of what all I have allowed you to have. And you just happen to think you did it all on your own. You think you're smarter than me? You think you're smarter than Daniel? You think you're in control? Well, let's just see how in control you really are. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, that is, the he is something on his own. Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against, against uh, the beauty of thy wisdom. Can't you hear just a little bit of sarcasm in this? You think you're so smart. You think you're so much on your own. We're just going to see what's going to happen to your wisdom. And they shall defile thy brightness. Oh, that's a key word there, brightness. Because this is a shining one. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the sea. In other words, not only are you going to die, you're going to see where your arrogance has killed all your armies and people that have been with you. How many know our sin doesn't just affect ourselves? It affects everyone else. He's not only going to die himself, he's going to see the death that he has brought to his kingdom. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God, and in the hand of him that slayeth thee, thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up this lamentation upon the who? The king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Could he be talking about the way he sees himself? The exalted position. Yet God put him there. But he turned it around for his own. It says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, when people read that, they say, Well, see, that's the devil. Because he was in the garden of Eden. What he is saying is, the king had it made. The word Eden means pleasure. Garden of Pleasure. He was. Only he thought it was by what he did. Thou hast been in Eden, the Garden of God. You, man, you've had paradise on earth. And it goes in every precious stone was I covering the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, 
the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the gold, and the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. What God was saying was, you were created for this place of greatness that I placed you in. But this, but you was lifted up in your heart thinking, this was all by your own doing. Not giving me the glory. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee that thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, and thou hast walked up and down the midst of the stones of fire. This is another idea where they say, well, see, that was back somewhere before. No, it's symbolic language. The king is the one who is the covering for his nation. Amen? He's supposed to. What he does is supposed to be for the good of everyone. Not for his own selfish agenda. That's what he means. The anointed there means he was placed there by God. How many are with me? But instead... It was a selfish thing for him. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the days that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Again, another scripture that they use to say that he was a beautiful angel, that the devil was a beautiful angel. The Bible says he was a liar from the beginning, a murderer from the beginning. All this means was when God chose this man, his intentions were good. Until he got lifted up in lawlessness, iniquity. And he began to do things his way. See, it's describing the nature of man without God. By, thy, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as a profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, and thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground and will lay thee before kings that thou mayest behold them. How many can see all through this it says that he is going to die. As a man, though he thinks he is a god. It is the king of Tyrus. But it is representing the whole nature of man. Now, the last part, I'm going to go to Isaiah 14. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified. See, people come to conclusions because they don't read the Bible enough to know its language. The terms that it uses. In the Middle Ages, man knew the language. And whenever they, or whenever they would crown a king, how many know they would anoint him? Because they believed that that king was ordained of God. Because God is 
in ultimate control. Amen. Isaiah chapter 14. Starting in verse 1. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, the captive Jews in Babylon, in parentheses, and will again choose Israel and set them in their own land. And foreigners who are proselytes will join them and cleave to the house of Jacob, Israel. And the peoples of, ba of Babylonia shall take them and bring them to their own country of Judea and aid in the restoring them and the house of Israel will possess the foreigners who prefer to stay with them in the land of the Lord as, as male and female servants and they will take captive not by physical or not by uh, moral might those whose captives they have been and they will rule over them it goes on let me i'm having a hard time with this print in this bible's rather small i'm going to go to verse four you shall take up this okay this there's a there if notice there where that where it talks about the shining one that's where in the King James and other translations it's Lucifer and this is what it says in the footnotes why it did that this whole prophecy is generally conceded to have been written long over a century 170 years according to ushers let me see if I'm reading in the right spot no I'm not over here light bringer or shining one was originally translated Lucifer, but because of the association of that name with Satan, it is not now used. Some students feel that the application of the name Lucifer to Satan, in spite of the long and confident teaching of that effect, is erroneous. Lucifer, the light bringer, is the Latin equivalent of the Greek word phosphorus, which is used as a title of Christ in 2 Peter 1.19 and corresponds to the name Bright Morning Star in Revelation 22.16, which Jesus called himself. The application of this name has, has existed since the third century. So before the third century A.D., it was never used. Now I lost my place. <laughs> oh, and is based on the supposition that Luke ten eighteen is an explanation of Isaiah fourteen twelve, which some authorities feel is not true. So there are the translators of the Amplified Bible giving you the reason why they do not use the word Lucifer. All the word Lucifer means is shining one. It'd be like a rock star. Someone who's famous. Someone that shines. Everybody knows who he is. Well, that's the way these kings thought about themselves. Sure they thought they were above yes. the rest of the mortal men. They thought of themselves as being gods. They were even worshipped. And that's why he said, Thou art fallen. It represents the nature of unregenerated man. It does, it does in one sense, represent the devil. And that is that way of thinking. Come on, how many are hearing me? But it does not refer to some beautiful angel before creation who led a rebellion against God and God cast him out. His origin was the serpent in the garden and what he represented. 
He was a murderer from the beginning, a liar from the beginning. And he created that nature in man to make man think that he's as big as God. But G and that mind has ruled. But Jesus brought that one to ruination on Calvary's cross. Amen. And today, he has no power except for those who still are deceived and believe his lies. Today, the shining one is Christ. And you. You are now the, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Well, wouldn't it blow people's minds if we called each other Lucifer? Or called Christ Lucifer? Well, he is. He's the shining one. He's the bright morning star. These guys just thought they were the shining one. Well, they were. I mean, God placed them in that place. But they got lifted up in pride. Oh, praise the Lord. How many can see how big an enemy pride is? Oh, praise the Lord. Well, that's my message for today.